um, basically what I will be presenting is a, is a kind of work in progress. So I'm I'm trying to uh, uh, it's a long time project of mine. So I'm uh, um, I'm working on it since uh, quite some years and uh, 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 always up and then. So um, uh, but um, um, yeah. So so for that reason, the results are. Uh, preliminary and uh, and um, please say your comments are very welcome. Um, so uh, currently, uh, I have uh, collected. So basically, what I'm doing is I'm collecting diachronies uh, of differential object marking systems, um, either uh, from publications uh, that are specifically to diachronies of particular DOM systems, or uh, I, I try to reconstruct. Um, well, to stick with uh, uh, with the highest uh, 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 probability, so to things that are well, let's put it differently, the things that are uh, very likely, uh, I try to reconstruct on the basis of comparison with closely related languages, right? So this is what we often actually do when we want to know something about historical development if we don't have uh, diachronic data. But of course, uh, uh, this is a database, and this database also contains quite a number of gaps uh, for uh, is precisely for for these reasons. Uh, so it's uh, it contains uh, fifty three languages and fourteen families uh, currently. Okay, so what is a, a differential object marking? Probably every one of you know it, but uh, just to uh, uh, recapitulate briefly. So, for example, in Russian, uh, <clears throat> uh, in one particular declension only. Uh, animate objects are marked, right, with the accusative that historically stems from the genitive, and inanimate objects are unmarked um, because the nominative uh, and accusative endings basically conflated here uh, into zero. So um, everyone, well, you all know know this. Um, so I won't uh, discuss this much. Another example is Spanish. This is a kind of textbook example for differential object marking system. Spanish is slightly, slightly different from uh, from Russian in that, um, yeah, right. So these are the two examples, right? I saw the woman uh, versus I saw the table. Uh, animacy plays uh, also an important role in in Spanish, but in addition. <laughs> Uh, in addition to animacy, uh, also um, definiteness, uh, more specifically, the specificity plays a role. So not only uh, the object has to be animate, but it should also be um, at, uh, definite or at least specific. So that's a small, well, on the typo from the typological perspective, that's a small difference between uh, uh, Russian and um, <clears throat> and Spanish. This is a, This is our... Uh, uh, well, uh, narrow definition, we uh, try to define differential, well, actually differential argument marking. Um, and um, for specific reasons, we ended up having two definitions. One is the narrow definition, one is kind of the broad definition that is more flexible. Um, there are reasons for that, uh, which I will not uh, discuss uh, in more detail here. So uh, the narrow definition is uh, any kind of situation where an argument of a predicate bearing the same generalized semantic role or macro role may be coded in different ways. And importantly, de depending on factors other than argument role itself. Right, so basically you have one and the same predicate, uh, the role of the object, the semantic role of the object remains the same, but and yet um, you may code uh, this object in different ways. So that's basically the essence of this definition. Um, DOM is interesting because it's actually the cross-linguistically preferred option. So, um, so languages which have uh, uh, across the board marking, so not non-differential marking, are actually uh, quite rare. And uh, uh, normally, uh, uh, languages uh, tend to um, uh, mark some types of objects, and uh, not while not marking uh, some other types of objects or a, or have um, um, different uh, ways of marking of different objects. And um, uh, as we have seen, the Spanish and the uh, Russian example, well, indeed, animacy and specificity are, in fact, the main factors that condition differential object marking systems across the world. Um, 
Uh, he, I refer to Kai Yusinimaki's work from 2014. Um, he has also a, a, a number of other factors that may also condition differential object marking systems, but they are really uh, um, infrequent. So there are many factors, but each of them is quite infrequent. Okay, so why do we do dichronic typology instead of kind of normal synchronic typology? Um, this is probably also quite familiar to you. I just uh, recapitulate this as an um, introduction. So, so in typology, we distinguish on the one hand the so-called static approach, where we, uh, um, we draw our conclusions basically only on the synchronic distribution of uh, uh, linguistic phenomena across languages. Right, so what we do is basically we collect, we, we try to collect uh, a sample that uh, should be, um, <clears throat> that should be uh, uh, balanced aerially and genealogically. Then we see if a particular pattern is not randomly distributed in the languages of the sample, then this is something interesting for us. So it might be either uh, have aerial clusters, then this is an aerial story, or it might be might uh, just be the prevailing um, pattern, and then it's kind of more universal uh, thing. Okay, but then, uh, uh, well, not actually, not that recently, uh, uh, many people, um, probably since Maslova, uh, has um, um, <clears throat> argued that we also need uh, to look into dynamics. Um, <clears throat> What is mean dynamics are basically comparison of two subsequent uh, diachronic stages. For, so we, we want to see we want to see sort of the vector of the development and not not the synchronic distribution, right? So um, so uh, in this um, dynamic or diachronic typology, we rather talk about uh, pull forces, right? Because if there is a particular uh, tendency to develop. Um, uh, for a particular linguistic phenomena to develop in one way, but not in some other way, then there must be, some, well, the tough is there is some kind of pull force behind it. Um, <clears throat> yes, and the reason for uh, for doing uh, rather, um, uh, sorry, uh, reason for doing uh, rather diachronic typology or dynamic typology is that uh, some people have said that uh, uh, that uh, we should uh, um, that actually the, the 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 dynamic evidence so um, is actually more telling than the synchronic distribution for many reasons that I would not um, um, detail right now. Okay, uh, right. So um, let me just tell you why the talk is called Pumwart. It was basically, I was trying to, I just explained to you what is DOM system, why it's a diachronic typology. Now, why there is this word toward? I already briefly mentioned it. It's just because, um, first of all, it's a work in progress, so I don't have, uh, it's not published. It's, uh, I'm, I'm working on it. And uh, secondly, I will just present you some few, um, some few aspects of uh, diachronic typology. I will not discuss uh, all of it. Um, so first of all, I will, uh, present you one particular developmental path, namely a uh, DOM system developing from a topic marker in this location. Uh, then I will discuss um, <clears throat> this very frequent claim that DOM and datives are somehow diachronically related. Uh, and uh, if I will have time, I will also talk about the role of this ambiguation factor in the, in the uh, in, in DOM systems. So let's see, but um, let's see whether I will have uh, time for all three points. And then I will present the conclusions. So emergence of DOM uh, from a topic marker in this location. Uh, well, just to give you an overview. Well, so far I have come across approximately, well, eight developmental paths for DOM systems. Uh, so from a topic marker, from a former cleft, from an indirect object marker, possibly this is something that I will um, talk in a little bit more detail. Uh, well, quite rarely from partitive genitive uh, under negation, from serial, very frequently from serial verb uh, constructions um, with the verb to take, uh, reanalysis of subjects into objects, optional dropping uh, of the former rigid marking, and uh, this is quite frequent, and this is something that we know from Indo-European languages. The, the last path, developmental path, that is, that is the 
kind of differential loss of case distinctions, right? So, so um, well, early Indo-European was uh, uh, one of these languages that probably had uh, almost uh, across the board uh, direct object marking, and yet many modern languages lost um, uh, the accusative case, but they didn't lose it in all declensional classes, they lost it only somewhere. Like, for example, Russian, we just saw it, or even English, right, which lost uh, uh, all case distinctions in the nouns, but not in pronouns. Okay, and this, of course, and loss may also give rise to differential object marking systems. Okay, so let's uh, discuss, um, uh, well, let's see from a former dislocated topic marker. So this uh, path, developmental path, works like this. Uh, this is, uh, of course, very rough uh, structure. So, so there is a source construction where uh, there is a dislocation and there is a, uh, some, uh, also some dislocation marker, like in English, S4. And, um, and the object then is uh, resumed in the main clause. So something like, uh, but as to the others, I will see them later, right? So it's, um, as to the others, is dislocated uh, and it is resumed uh, with them uh, in the main clause. Now, this kind of construction may uh, develop uh, into differential object marking system, and um, it very often happens that then uh, this dislocated topic marker, this S2 marker or S4 marker, develops uh, into the into the direct object mark. So basically, a dislocated structure sort of merges and we get instead of kind of um well sort of biclosal structure or or one and a half closal structure we get uh just monoclosal structure so uh i don't know to what extent i'm I'm not a specialist in english but it seemed to me that this might be a well good comparison so look s2 is the dislocated topic marker in two but in three it's almost uh functioning as a as object marker well, but the only difference that it introduces not a nominal object, but rather a complement clause. But well, okay. So just to give you just to give you an idea of how this developmental path works, and uh, importantly, this is um, mm, well. So far, uh, this seems to me to be uh, really one of the most frequent developmental paths, and also. Um, um, uh, um, not only frequently, but also, uh, mm, well, uh, not aerially, uh, not aerially clustered. So quite distributed also uh, across the world, but um, well, uh, with all due claims uh, to the small size of my sample. Okay, so what kind of evidence do we have? Uh, well, in old Romance languages, we find um, uh, basically primarily the dislocation uh, and then in modern Romance languages, we find monoclosal structures. Um, I will just, in a minute, in a second, we'll give you the examples. So, for example, in Latin, we find uh, the preposition ad. Um, as a example, it, works, it works just uh, as the topic marker, as the marker of the dislocated topic. As here, and look, uh, uh, as for Dolabella, as you write, I think that we should act in this way. So the labella is even not um, part of the argument structure of the following two uh, uh, clauses. So uh, so it's really just a well, what what sometimes been called a frame topic or something. Okay, another example is uh, is um, the French uh, 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 well the South and South French dialect. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, where uh, personal pronouns um, that um, uh, correspond to the object role in the same clause that they are often dislocated. So, uh, so you can say something like "amoi personne ne me veut," um, or uh, "avec" not only person, well, yes, and uh, uh, also um, also definite nouns. Uh, <clears throat> But um, it seems that, uh, well, in this variety, um, even though it's dislocated, but here it's differently from Latin, uh, mostly the objects are dislocated in this way. So it's not 
It's not that anything can be dislocated. Well, right, we would not, for just a regular uh, dislocated topic, we would not expect any restrictions as regards syntactic roles. So subjects may be dislocated, objects may be dislocated, non-argumental uh, nominal phrases may be dislocated. But in this dialect, it seems that it's primarily used with objects. So there is this trend apparently towards uh, um, a differential object one. Um, and uh, if we compare uh, the situation in Old Spanish with Modern Spanish, uh, we see the following situation. So compare five with six. Uh, in both cases, um, uh, the object is, um, right, so the first example is we will ridicule the daughters of Campeador, and in the second, his daughters, he carried uh, in his arms. So in both cases, the daughters are sort of logical object, but yet um, uh, it is marked with the preposition only when it is dislocated. And uh, in the uh, fi in five, where it is not dislocated, it's not marked with the preposition. So something that, uh, so these prepositions is something that comes later only in modern Spanish, right? So in modern Spanish, five would have required the preposition. So here again, you see that, uh, the source construction is probably the topic, the dislocated topic construction, and, um, and this is what we find in Old Spanish, and this develops in modern Spanish into uh, into the uh, regular differential object marking systems system um, such that we saw in uh, in the example above uh, in my introduction. Yeah, right. So this is the difference. Uh, okay. So then. Uh, um, well, and this is something. This is something that is not. Uh, this is something that is not. Uh, I have found it has been claimed uh, by uh, uh, people studying uh, differential ob history of differential object marking in, in Romance uh, languages. So this is quite. So this is quite um, quite safe. Now we can move to other languages where we don't have uh, this the same degree of uh, uh, of uh, safety, so to say. Um, so Kanuri is a, uh, a Saharan language, and it uses um, it has this uh, marker ga, uh, which um, similarly to the examples from Romans above, uh, can be used as for um, a dislocated topic, right? So in nine, as for me, I cannot come. See here, uh, it's not the object; it's the subject that is dislocated. So it's just a, just a normal topic marker, which is. Uh, which is uh, compatible with all kinds of uh, syntactic relations in the main clause. So it's not restricted to objects. Um, and yet the same marker um, is used as differential object marker. So in 10, uh, it is really just a sort of differential accusative mark. So Musa saw him. Um, uh, uh, same in 11. <clears throat> Um, so this is a quite typical situation that uh, pronouns require the differential object marker, whereas nouns uh, either do not require or uh, are more kind of more flexible with it or more option. Um, okay, so um, uh, sorry, there is something. Uh, oh, sorry, there is something. No, uh, just a moment. I had I, I'm missing another slide. Um, <clears throat> um, some reason doesn't want to go up. <clears throat> I have no idea. Um, okay, for some reason I'm missing another slide. So there should have been another slide for for Kanuri. So if we uh, um, if we look um, into the closely related language, namely uh, Tubu. What we find is that uh, this language also has a ga marker, uh, and this marker is also is uh, primarily used there uh, as dislocated topic marker. Um, so, uh, for and since these are two closely related languages, it's very likely that uh, we have the same development as in Roman. So, from a dislocated topic marker uh, into differential object marker. Um, there is also a, a kind of logical um, reasoning for that. Um, it's more likely that we find 
a development from um, from a topic marker to a marker of a syntactic role, then vice versa. So so uh, so an accusative uh, that would develop into well any kind of information structural marker would be would be quite something that we don't uh, find actually, or at least I'm not aware of such instances. Whereas vice versa is quite often. So focus or topic marker very often develop into case markers. So that's that's quite frequent development actually. Okay. Um, right, and I'm, maybe I will skip that. It's not that important. And I will turn to uh, to the second point. Um, so I'm just I'm just picking some particular aspects of the diachrony. There is there are many more aspects. So um, uh, differential object marking systems and datives. So this is this uh, third, so so to say, third developmental path. So basically, from well, dative is of course kind of more Indo-European style terminology. Uh, so basically, from and more correctly would be to say from an indirect object marker into direct object marker. And this has been claimed by many many people. So that um, this is uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, known truth that uh, well. Uh, datives tend to develop into new accusatives, and uh, why do why do they do this? Uh, because of the semantic affinity. So um, you know, datives or indirect objects are normally uh, are normally animate, and uh, most of the time they are definite, right? So, for example, with the verb to give, you um, it's very rare that someone gives something to an to an unknown person, so to say. So. And uh, it, it, it is even more rarely that someone gives uh, something to an inanimate entity, right? So you normally give something to to, to an animate um, participant. So datives have uh, this uh, affinity to uh, animacy and definiteness. And so uh, many people have said, okay, but then it's logical that uh, since uh, differential object marking systems are themselves very often based on animacy and definiteness, then of course, such a development as a uh, from dative into accusative is very likely because of this semantic affinity of um, of the uh, in the selectional uh, input, right? So both uh, tend to be uh, used with animates and specifics or animate and definite. Uh, so specifically for Romans, uh, and Giorgio Yamala, who is really a famous person on uh, uh, when it comes to differential object marking, um, so he claimed that uh, well, um, um, like in uh, uh, Latin, right? So this preposition ad uh, from Latin it had the originally an allative function, so going to someone, uh, then it developed a new topic mark, and then exactly this development that I have just discussed, so from dative into dom mark, has occurred. I just here just uh, some quotes and uh, some uh, examples for languages that uh, people have mentioned in this regard. I will skip it. So um, let's look into more detail. So how how does it exactly work for those cases for which we have um, some data? <clears throat> so maybe we should first start with English because uh, in English we, as I said before, we have. Um, uh, we have differential object marking system that works such that personal pronouns are marked to object and everything else is unmarked. Right? So me, us, him, her, etc. are kind of object forms, uh, whereas we, I, etc. are subject forms. So there is a distinction. Now, what's interesting, these forms historically are actually indeed as uh, uh, are, are datives. Historically, so uh, so indeed there is this development from dative into accusative. Now the question is, well, um, but did it exactly work the same way as I just uh, explained? So is did the semantic affinity really play the role? So remember, uh, datives are prim predominantly animate and definite, and so they tend to develop into accusatives. So is this is this um, is this a good explanation for English? Now what we find in old English is that actually it doesn't fit. So uh, so what we find is that a number of nouns in old English 
uh, already in old English uh, started not distinguishing between dative and accusative. So, for example, uh, feminine singular, well, strong declension, so called strong declension, had invariably the ending e for both for dative and for the accusative. Uh, something like uh, sorge, right? Which is uh, probably the old English form of sorrow or sorry. Um, it did, simply did not distinguish between dative and accusative uh, because the, um, because of the reduction of the endings. And the same is for some other declensional types. So like um, the weak declension in which the ending un, uh, did not distinguish between dative and accusative. Okay. Yet what is important, these nouns are actually inanimate now. So it's not the case, as we have seen, as has been claimed before, that, uh, well, it's because of the semantic affinity. So uh, mostly animate and definite. No, uh, neither name nor sorrow are uh, animate. So there is no semantic affinity. And that is something that we already find in Old English. So this is quite old. Uh, now, the personal pronouns that are historically um datives they inflect uh in this strange way uh, as shown in this table so basically such that um there is a dative form and there is a, another form uh which is called accusative but it can be coded either by the accusative or by the dative so basically what we find here rather is that there is a merger of uh dative and accusative into one case and in, into that's what we find in modern English, right? Into something which may be called an object a object form. Right? So mech, for example, first singular is an old accusative, whereas me is an old dative, right? So you see mech, you see it, uh, for example, in uh, uh, in German, right? Where it is still me as accusative, whereas uh, me is, uh, is, is a dative. Right. Okay, so uh, so what we find is that the dative accusative syncretism started in English apparently with, with nouns, because with nouns we we don't have any distinction distinctions anymore. And this happened with nouns by sound change, not because the nouns were somehow not because of the semantic affinity, because they were animate or definite. Or at least, okay, about definite, I didn't say anything about definite, but at least they were not anime, that's clear. Um, <clears throat> and what happened is that the whole system basically developed into having just one single object case. And apparently what happened in the pronominal system is just uh, an analogy to what happened in the noun. So in nouns, there is already, with many nouns, there is already no distinction between date and accusative. And pronouns simply uh, were uh, followed this development. So actually, the development in pronouns uh, is kind of secondary and not prim primary as something, you know. So basically, we, what we found is that um, the development is uh, exactly reversed than what would be predicted by the semantic affinity explanation. Right? So semantic affinity would require that first animate. Um, uh, nouns and of course personal pronouns are always animate so that they will first um, uh, uh, turn uh, they will first uh, be used with the dative and that in, in in the direct object position okay romance is quite simple because we just uh, we just saw that um, uh, in romance the development of differential object marker are the preposition um, uh, comes from um, from dislocated topic and not from a dative. It happens so that uh, in Romans the same marker developed also into dative, but that's uh, but that's a different uh, a different development. Yes. So incipiently, right? Uh, so again, uh, uh, there is a, there are quite a number uh, of uh, arguments for this, but for example, again the same example with um, uh, with this uh, South French dialect that um, 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 which seems to incipiently kind of starting 
to develop a uh, differential object marking system in the in the sense that it dislocates uh, it has only dislocated topic um, which correspond to the direct object in the main clone. So it there is a restriction, right? So from a dislocated topic, we would not expect that it that it is uh, somehow restricted to a particular syntactic role in the main clause. Um, but what happened is that when languages start, when when they start developing into uh, DOM, then uh, dislocated topics start to be restricted to just um, dislocated objects, direct objects, and not something else. But what's interesting, uh, this R marker is used here for dislocated topic, but um, uh, and indeed, uh, and of course, uh, we all know this uh, is also used for for the dative uh, in French. Um, so one could think that maybe here the ex explanation works that it comes really from dative, that the differential object marking system comes from dative. But yet, precisely when it comes to the object marking, the object form of the first singular, it's it's not amour, right? It's it's me, it's me or or me <laughs> reduced to. Me. Right, so um, so it doesn't fit. Okay, so to sum up, um, so the scenario from allative marker to topic marker to dative marker and then to DOM marker should be discarded for romance uh, uh, because the following developments apparently did not occur. So there is no development from topic marker to dative marker and there is no development from dative marker to DOM marker. Rather, what happened in romance is that um, the allative marker develops into topic marker and then into dom marker, and then there is uh, another totally independent development from allative marker to dative marker. Right. So this is also quite frequent. Something that is quite frequent that uh, allatives or adhesives that they develop into datives. <laughs> so these are two independent developments, and we should not kind of merge them into one developmental path. This is also Right, this is frequent, right, in grammaticalization that one and the same thing um, may develop into different, uh, um, uh, may develop different grammatical functions. So English have is uh, famous for it, right? So it can have the modal meaning, it can have a perfect meaning, uh, etc. And perfect meaning is in Eng of English have is probably unrelated historically to the modal meaning of have. Yes, right. So uh, we, I discussed also this. Um, mm, I will uh, skip that. Uh, now, uh, Persian, the same has been claimed for Persian, right? So Persian has differential object marking system that is based on the suffix ra or, or its allomorphs. And indeed, this, um, this marker has, is found even in modern Persian as uh, still to, to have the function of, uh, uh, of topic marker. So, like here in 20, as for probably the last night, uh, I did not sleep at all. Uh, see, again, it's it's a it's a clear topic, dislocated topic marker because it's uh, it's even not an argument of the main clone. Yeah, just another example from uh, 13th century. Another example. Okay, so um, so at least so far we have uh, established that this marker has uh, had also uh, had also had um, the the S four function, so the dislocated topic marker function. But historically, Ra could also mark dative. So this is this is why we discuss it. So it's it's still uh, it's still quite similar to Romans. Again, we have the same. The same marker marks both uh, differential object mark is or well it, it is a differential object marker and at the same time it's it's a indirect object mark. But the problem is it doesn't historically it doesn't work the way that the data developed into accusative. If we look uh, if we look at the distribution the frequency of this marker in different semantic roles in uh, Middle Persian, then what we find, look uh, at the last two column where it's uh, used uh, uh, to mark arguments, 
And you see that um, it is very rarely used as indirect object marker, and yet it is already used as direct object marker. Okay, and that's it. Does that actually these figures seems to me do not fit actually um, an explanation that would say well dative developed into accusative because how could that have happened if at this stage the function of the, the dative function itself is very incipient right so it's only in one percent of the case and it's very rare that it's used um, as a indirect object and yet it is already used as direct object so it's not that it has been established in already as a as a kind of full-fledged dative and now it can start the development towards uh, accusative no it's um it is very incipient here so apparently it seems that these two developments into dative and into accusative are kind of run in parallel so something something that we exactly saw uh in romans okay so i'm talking about this uh, so look, it's it's primarily used uh, for topic function, about function, and then purposive for the sake of, right? So that's the most frequent seeds. The first column, it's uh, most of the examples are uh, there. Mm. Okay. So exactly. So the conclusion is that the spread of Ra uh, onto both direct and indirect objects must have started by early Middle Persian period slightly preferring direct objects than in than the indirect objects right so um, <clears throat> okay so i think therefore the change from dative into accusative must be discarded from middle person even though it has been claimed uh, or it has been at least assumed that it might be just because of this general idea that datives generally tend to develop into um, accusatives and uh, by contrast, the dislocated topic origin uh, is uh, supported because we really have examples where Ra really marks in uh, dislocated topics or discourse topics. Okay, yes. Um, I have another example, but um, I think, well, okay, um, maybe just let's um, go through them very briefly. These are two small um, uh, Tibeto Burman languages. Uh, what happened there um, is that um, they both have also differential object marking system uh, with this uh, with this specific mark, which runs either zero or this uh, particular uh, preposition prepositions. But here again, the story is just to already to to anticipate. Uh, yet it's it's the same problem that uh, the same marker is used for both for direct for the direct objects for, and for the indirect objects. So theoretically, a development from a dative into accusative is is at least uh, possible given this um, homonymy. <clears throat> but in fact, uh, uh, if we look more into detail, then it seems that again the same thing. Uh, these are two independent developments. Um, <clears throat> So the primary function of this uh, marker um, is um, disambiguation. These are quite rare differential object marking systems that run only along the disambiguation. So only when A and P may be confused, the marker is used. <clears throat> and they also mark uh, the recipient. And they mark also many other things. And that's interesting because they mark basically all kinds of uh, two argument uh, constructions. Uh, precisely uh, those ones where often, um, or, or most of them are those where, uh, of course, one of the arguments should be distinguished from the other. So like in comparative, right? So if you say uh, he's taller than him, of course, you have to know who is, uh, who is he first and who is he, he second, right? Uh, it's quite important to know who is taller than who, right? Uh, so you have to distinguish, you have to disambiguate uh, somehow the uh, compare and the standard. And it's interesting that uh, in this language, the same marker is used for all these functions. Uh, so apparently, um, yes, and, and um, yes, and um, <clears throat> uh, yes, it is used for as differential object marking marker, as I said uh, already, it's used um, to disambiguate A from P. 
but um, uh, the original function is uh, probably the focus function. So the contrastive focus like here. So Volo washed that pair of trousers, not this one. <clears throat> so apparently what happened is that um, somehow the disambiguation is related to the original uh, contrastive focus function. So this is a, some uh, focus marker that uh, developed into a disambiguation, a kind of a disambiguator in all kinds of two argument uh, constructions. And, um, and of course, as a result, uh, direct objects and indirect objects uh, uh, are not distinguished in, in, in this language. But this is not because uh, uh, dative uh, well, indirect object market developed into direct object market. Okay, so this is a kind of uh, very brief. Um, okay, so just to summarize uh, uh, these few cases, so dative, dative accusative syncretism seems to be a quite recurrent phenomenon, That's, that is true, uh, but a very divergent dichronic processes lead to the proliferation of dative accusative syncretism. And I um, suggest that dative accusative syncretism is due to a more general cross-linguistic phenomenon of simply not distinguishing between direct objects and indirect objects, so something that we find in English. Um, right, so so I gave Mary the book, where Mary and the book are not really distinguished. Mm -hmm. um, and that means for us that, for or at least for me, for the, for the dichronic uh, um, research that at least uh, if, if I find a language where there is a dative accusative syncretism or when the direct and indirect object are coded alike, then I should not use just this uh, as uh, um, this fact as uh, evidence in favor of the development from dative into accusative. So, so in fact, it's, I, I, don't, I don't want to discard this such a development. I just want to say that uh, um, maybe it's not as frequent as we have uh, thought actually before. <clears throat> yes. Okay. So I don't have. I don't know how much time do I have. Um, I just wanted to say some words on this ambiguity. Maybe someone. Uh, okay. See in the chat. Um, no. So can someone tell me how much time do I have? Um, because we start a little bit later, so I'm not. I'm just a bit confused. Um, Hello. You have three minutes left. Three minutes. Okay. Yes, and then ten for questions, but you can. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, okay, that's uh, good. Okay. Okay, so this ambiguation is pretty clear, right? So uh, uh, we quite we, we probably need it if we have uh, um, intransitive uh, clauses when both objects are similar. So Peter John C is not entirely clear who does what, right? Uh, or but it's different from table Peter Heats, right? Because there it's uh, quite clear that uh, we don't need actually to disambiguate who is doing what. Now, the role of disambiguation also has been, well, originally it people said like Comrie and, you know, they, they said that disambiguation is the main condition of differential object markets. Uh, <clears throat> And then the development um, um, uh, was such that um, at the end, uh, Hasperman says that, well, this immigration doesn't play any role at all. And what matters is the marking of the unexpected. So most of the time, uh, differential object marking systems, they mark uh, simply the unexpected object, and they don't care actually whether there is a potential ambiguity there in the clause or not. Okay, so uh, since I have only basically one minute left, so I'm um, okay. So the main claim is here is that disambiguation does actually play a role in diachronies of DOM. So I want to go kind of, um, I want to soften a little bit something that Hasperman says in his uh, work. Uh, but um, uh, I want to say that, um, well, indeed, if you look um, how differential object marking systems work synchronically, indeed. Uh, Hasperman's explanation probably uh, is uh, the best one, but um, very often disambiguation does play a role in the diachronies of differential object marking systems. 
somehow I have to find out the way to skip this. Okay. Um, 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 okay, I will skip this. Okay, so maybe I, will, I should mention just these facts. Um, there were other arguments before, but uh, I will leave them uh, for later. Uh, so, um, so when it comes to my sample, what I found is that 73% of my languages, um, they develop differential object markers in situations where no other object marker is present. So, so most of the time we have, uh, we find that um, it's not the case that there is an object marker and then it is uh, being replaced by a new object marker. No, um, most of the time, DOM systems develop in situations where there is no differential object marker at all. So, uh, and the language basically has doesn't has no means to distinguish between subject and object. Okay, so uh, maybe this is uh, just one interesting argument in favor of. Uh, of my claim. Okay. Uh, okay. And now I turn to conclusion. Sorry for skipping some of the parts. Okay. So, so what I've said before is that, that there are different pathways leading to a DOM system, and probably there are even more than those that I've listed. Uh, but there are some which are more frequent and others that are a little bit less frequent. So often uh, there is some kind of dislocated topic construction which develops into monoclosal construction. Um, this is actually, by the way, something that I have also observed that quite often, also in other developmental paths, we find uh, the development of monoclization. So, so basically that um, originally more than one clause was involved in the source construction. Okay. Uh, then I presented you a little bit of data uh, claiming that um, we should kind of soften our claims uh, with regard to um, <clears throat> the development from datives into accusatives. So apparently it's not that often actually as um, has been claimed before. And uh, even if we find dative and accusative syncretism, that doesn't mean, that doesn't presuppose the development of, uh, uh, of a dative into accusative as has been explained before due to semantic affinity because well, because datives are Animate and definite, and so they are likely to develop into a uh, differential object mark. Okay, I just I didn't say that much. I didn't talk about that much about ambiguity avoidance. So I will skip these slides. I will just resume. Well, I will just um, uh, uh, repeat the fact. Well, the, the claim that uh, I want to make is that uh, on the synchronic level, indeed, we don't actually the disambiguation factor is not actually that important. So there are differential object marking systems which work only along disambiguation, but they are quite rare. Um, but if we look into diachronies of differential object marking system, we really need the disambiguation factor as one of the explanations for, for the changes that we observe. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So now we have uh, nine minutes left for questions. So please raise your hand if you are in the main um, uh, hall there, or you can ask your questions in chat or raise your hand in the conference. So Lisa, do you have any questions, like offline questions? Not yet. Okay. Oh, there is a question from a question from Aigul. So please turn on your microphone. Mm -hmm. uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah. Thanks for your talk. Uh, I was wondering about the uh, topic shift, not topic shift constructions, but these dislocated <laughs> topic constructions. Uh, well, in fact, I was wondering. Uh, when and how, like this biclosal construction changes into a monoclosal construction, and I can imagine that it should involve at least um, the disappearance in many cases 
of the arguments in the main clause, right? Like, like for example, if it's uh, expressed by a pronoun, it should be kind of dropped or maybe changed into agreement. And maybe sometimes the word order changes. And I was wondering, like, in which order these changes proceed and uh, kind of maybe how fast this happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, that's a uh, that's a reasonable, quite reasonable question. So um, I think well, the situation is uh, different. So uh, uh, in in Romans or in Spanish, you know, there is this, uh, there is still, uh, you know, what is called uh, double, you know, the object doubling, or or you can call it object indexing. So so the the resumption of the object still remains there, and actually it's. Um, most of the time, it occurs with the with the DOM. So there is kind of um, so the object is uh, marked twice, right? So one time it's marked on the uh, via the critic um, uh, pronoun, and second time it's marked by the preposition. Um, but for example, in Persian, it's it was differently. So so there uh, uh, the uh, uh, pronouns disappear. Or, or maybe they didn't, you know, it, th that's, the, that's the problem. Maybe they never existed there. So uh, it probably depends on the language whether uh, you need an explicit resumption or not. So um, languages may differ there, you know, where, whether they require really an object uh, pronoun, resuming object pronoun, or maybe they can just uh, have a kind of, uh, well, a sort of ellipsis there. Or, um, so that's um, that's my. But I think you asked also something else. Uh, whether the word order kind of changes no, and yes. the dislocated part. Uh, yes, yes, and that's, that's exactly what happened. Yes, so so that's exactly yes. So so that's exactly uh, the reason why I think the dislocated topic. Um, so so um, what you find is that. Uh, it's first, so from, of course, we don't have, that's the problem, of course, that we don't have uh, data from many languages. But for example, in Romans, what you find is that um, in uh, uh, Old Spanish, the uh, marked object is most of the time uh, the first in the in the clause. So it's, uh, it's, um, uh, it really takes the, well, it's difficult to some, because you know because the problem is that you never know uh, whether it is really dislocation or simply topicalization. But at least it's topicalized, right? So what is the difference between to topicalization and dislocation? In dislocation, you would have you would have, for example, something like a, a, resum a resumptive pronoun there. But what if your if your language doesn't require resumption? Uh, then is it dislocation or is it topicalization? Probably you can do some syntactic tests, but these are old texts, so uh, so you can't uh, test it out. So you okay. So anyway, so indeed uh, in old Spanish, most of the time marked objects are fronted. Let's put it like that. And then in modern Spanish, they are not fronted anymore, or at least uh, 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 not regularly. Mm -hmm. Thank so you. There is a change in word order. Yes. Okay, we have uh, time for some more questions. Uh, Maxim Fedotov and then Natalia Sardavorska. I think, I think Natalia was the first. She wrote in the chat. Okay, okay I just couldn't decide. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, I have a question about Persian. It's slide number 42. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you're claiming there that um, uh, th there's... Uh, there's no evidence for uh, claiming for the development from dative to uh, accusative. But what you have in this table is uh, a high percentage, a rather high percentage of beneficiary for um, Ra, right? And uh, it seems to me that semantically it's very close to dative uh, and at least uh, beneficiaries are more likely to be uh, animate and um, definite and uh, topic-like, right? Uh, so uh, could that be considered uh, as a possible hypothesis uh, of the possible development from beneficiaries to direct objects? And is there uh, 
any evidence uh, against it because the percentage is much higher than for about topics. Yes, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, of course, I, I, I cannot exclude uh, this, um, at least from what I know. And I don't know actually that much, to be honest. Um, um, well, I, the only thing that this table should show is that it's really not um, a development from a dative. And um, because the dative itself seems to be just... Uh, uh, kind of an incipient development at this stage, even though the accusative is already there. So um, maybe the data also itself develops from beneficiary, that's probably likely. Um, in any event, what is important for me uh, is that, um, yes, that um, there are two independent processes going on probably in Persian as well. So one is leading to direct object mark and the other one leading to indirect object mark. They're yes, not... I, I, I agree with you, of course, I, I think it's, it's yes, a very no. interesting point, but actually what I wanted to point uh, at it's is that, uh -huh, yeah, that the beneficiaries... Yes, yes, maybe maybe you're right. ...are I, also a good candidate and um, yeah, so maybe, uh -huh, okay. So I just, uh, yeah, I just don't... Um, um, in my, you know, in my list of the developments of DOM, I don't have uh, a developmental path from a beneficiary. But of course, uh, but of course, this is not, a, you know, uh, this kind of uh, evidence ex, ne uh, ex negativo, so to say, and this is uh, not a strong argument. But so for that reason, I would not assume it just on the basis of this Persian data. If I would have kind of more well, other cases where a beneficiary would develop directly into an uh, object marker, then... But of course, it's very difficult to distinguish, yes. Mm -hmm. I see, yes. thank you. Okay, I have some time for one short All question, right. Maxime. Yeah. Mm, thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I had a question about the paths that you identified. And uh, there was this slide in the beginning so I actually I wanted to ask uh, first whether the paths were um, arranging from the most frequent uh, to less frequent, and if and whether you have actually the numbers like uh, how many of each type you found actually. Just interesting. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's actually an interesting question, right? So uh, um, so actually, it seems that. Uh, a development from dislocate, dislocated topic is really very frequent. And not only it's frequent, but um, but it's not kind of, it's not, it's, it's not restricted to a particular area or to a particular, yeah, to a particular geographical area. So it seems, so for this reason, one can maybe think that this is a kind of something, something normal or, or, or quite, quite frequent. Let's put it like that. So it's not, uh, now the AIDS path, is also frequent, but uh, I don't know because um, uh, it is frequent in Indo-European because in Indo-European we know that, well, Proto-Indo-European had um, uh, across the board marking of accusative. So there were accusative for all kinds of nouns, regardless whether they were animate, definite, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and we find, uh, you, and, and we find that most of the modern in European languages, uh, well, except maybe for the Baltic languages, all other branches have lost cases to some extent. So beginning from Indo-Aryan up until Portuguese, which is uh, on the other side of the... Of the right, so... Uh, but, they, they, but there the question is, you know, to what extent is this something that is typical in European, or is it something that actually... I would actually, you know, I would, I would actually maybe dare to claim that um, that this is really that this is uh, this is really um, uh, a kind of um, a development that is uh, that is uh, motivated also by this universal pressure for having differential object mark mm -hmm. because uh, well because. Still, you know, these branches are very far away from each other. 
uh, they so it's very unlikely that Romans had any contacts with Indo-Aryan or something like that, um, or with Persian. Uh, and still, we find you know all over we find uh, uh, these contacts, uh, these developments. And also, we have this uh, un we have this typological evidence from Caius Cinemac that saying that differential object marking systems are the preferred option. So. Um, Okay, so, and then finally, the last remark I would make here is that there is also problem of the data, because, uh, of course, in order to claim that there was a across-the-board marking that developed into differential object marking, we have to know quite a lot about the proto-language. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you know, so, <laughs> so maybe we don't find it that frequently also because uh, we don't know that much about proto-language. So, so there is a data problem there as well. Okay, but I think, I think it should be. But I think it should be quite. I, I mean, as as soon as as there is a language with the uh, with uh, across the board marking, I would actually expect it to do, to to lose at least something and to develop into differential marking. 